Our final speaker is Graeme Shirley, who, who brings together the world of entertainment, as Anna's beautiful picture showed, the pianola, the pianola rolls, the music. Um, the 20s and 30s were really about an entertainment media revolution. And uh, during COVID, Zoom has kept so many of us going, but in the 1920s and 30s, it was really about Hollywood and the locally made film industry and the cinema. So our final uh, speaker for today is Graham Shirley, who worked as a director, writer and researcher on Australian historical documentaries. He's conducted numerous oral histories and is co-author of Australian Cinema, The First 80 Years, published by Currency Press. From 2006 to 2014, he worked for the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, initially as a senior curator and subsequently as their historian. Um, in mid-2014, he returned to freelance research, writing and consulting. And we're so fortunate that he's a member of the Royal Australian Historical Society's Councillor and a member of the Professional Historians Association New South Wales. Um, he, his interest in uh, cinema is mind-blowing and the areas that it covers um, equally broad. And we've asked him particularly to look at the um, films that might guide us through the 20s and 30s of this brand new world in fashion, design, music and social conventions. And over to you, Graeme. By the 1920s and 30s, evidence of modernism was visible across Australia. During World War I, fashion design had changed to reflect the simpler, more pragmatic needs of working women and men. Young people particularly were keen adopters of Americanised fashions, jazz, dance crazes and films. In the 1920s, Hollywood triggered the acceptance of mass-market cosmetics. New style buildings appearing in Australian cities of the 1920s and 30s included the city's huge department stores, along with offices, hotels, dance halls, cinemas and apartment blocks. In the suburbs, modern structures included smaller hotels, milk bars and local banks. By 1920, popular Sydney dance venues offering the latest in jazz bands included the Wentworth and Australia Hotels and the Palais Royal in the Royal Hall of Industries building at Moore Park. In 2008, art, architecture and design historians Anne Stephen, Philip Goad and Andrew McNamara wrote that in Australian cities and suburbs of the 1920s and 30s, cinemas and their films represented modernism's legitimate and unrestrained presence. It was certainly what audiences saw at the cinema in the 1920s and 30s that influenced fashion, behaviour, design, music, dance, moral challenges, and in the eyes of some, challenges to Australian character. In the eyes and minds of most film goers in this period, film was synonymous with America, which meant Hollywood. American cinema represented glamour, romance and an escape from the everyday. Because of Hollywood's dominance from the mid-1910s onward, the making of Australian feature films struggled to survive. But a persistent theme among the Australian films that were made were the dramas and comedies which highlighted differences between Australia's bush and city life. Among those films were The Breaking of the Drought, made in 1920, and Even the Sentimental Bloke, the classic film from 1919, which showed the distinctions in terms of the nurturing regenerative life of the bush and the parasitic corrupting cities. It was an old-fashioned distinction by 1920, but it still had currency in films for another two decades. Australian audiences' interest in American films began to notably rise in the early 1910s and it accelerated during World War I. In the 1920s, cinemas became a feature of almost every major Australian suburb and country town. As early as 1921, suburban cinema admissions exceeded those of the cities. Radio was another medium which spread to country towns as well as cities and suburbs. In November 1923, 
Sydney radio station 2SB, later called 2BL, was Australia's first public radio station. It was followed in January 1924 by 2FC. 1924 was also the year that the first Melbourne stations went to air. From its earliest days, radio did much not only to entertain, but also to break down a sense of isolation, to make even the remotest rural communities feel a connection to the rest of the world. Buying a car was still financially beyond most Australian families in the 1920s, but that decade introduced many householders to electricity in their own homes for the first time. Electricity allowed domestic use of electrical lighting, electric radios and record players, and of small appliances such as kettles, toasters and irons. Household appliances were advertised prolifically in such Australian magazines as The Home, which began publication in 1920. The Home often published advertisements which rather chauvinistically implied that the principal place of women at that time was literally at home. But in the 1920s, women in Australia did have the opportunity to produce and direct feature films. Among the best known were Lottie Lyle, who contributed to the direction of Raymond Longford's films, Visiting Americans, Bess Meredith and Yvonne Pavis, who wrote as well as contributed to the making of their male partners' films. Kate Howard, who co-directed a film adaptation for her play Possum Paddock. And former Hollywood star Louise Lovely, who co-directed the Tasmanian mining drama Jeweled Nights. In the late 1920s, there were also Isabel, Paulette and Phyllis McDonough, who are probably still the world's only three sister team, to have produced feature films. Born between 1899 and 1901, Isabel, Paulette and Phyllis were the eldest of the seven children of the well-known Sydney GP, Dr John McDonough and his wife Annie. Like many young people in the 1910s and 20s, the sisters were filmstruck from their earliest years. Before long, Paulette was watching a number of the same American films repeatedly, She carefully noted how the best of them drew emotional power from image framing and editing. Dr MacDonough died in 1920 and his wife Annie in 1924. After Annie's death, Isabel, Paulette and Phyllis used the family's spacious colonial mansion, Dremoyne House, in the Sydney suburb of Dremoyne, as the main location of the first and second of their three silent feature films. On those three films, and the one full sound film they made in the early 1930s, Paulette directed and wrote the scripts, Phyllis was art director, production manager and publicist, and Isabel, billed as Murray Lorraine, played a central starring role. The McDonough sisters produced their three silent feature films, Those Who Love, The Far Paradise and The Cheaters, between 1926 and 1929. Those Who Love's £1,000 budget came from an inheritance they received. Money for The Far Paradise was provided by the significant profits of those who love, while The Cheaters was funded by a family friend. All films were society melodramas telling of star-crossed young lovers in conflict with parental prejudice. While Dremoyne House, filmed with Dr MacDonough's antique furniture and art collection, was a key location for the first two films, the sisters also filmed on locations borrowed from friends and business people in return for publicity. Being modern women with an eye for fashion, the sisters also arranged contra deals to borrow and feature on screen the latest fashions in clothing, cars and household decor. The first two McDonough films were well reviewed. Smith's Weekly wrote of The Far Paradise. The picture has a smoothness and a finish rare in Australian films. It has something to do of the art that conceals art, that makes you forget you are watching a film and so lets you judge the drama on its own merits. Paulette and Isabel were particularly keen to ensure performances in their films were naturalistic and believable. Those Who Love is today a lost film, but judging by the other two McDonough silence, Isabel was an actress of considerable depth and emotional truth. The sisters' third silent, The Cheaters, entered production in June 1929, seven months after the Australian premiere of the American part sound film The Jazz Singer, starring Al Jolson. The Jazz Singer had been made in 1927, and within two years, its immense success had transformed the global film business from silent to sound films. 
At the end of 1929, when the McDonough's tried selling the silent version of The Cheetahs to Australian film distributors adapting to American talkies, it was rejected. Over the next two years, the sisters twice attempted to make the film saleable by adding sound on disc and then sound on film soundtracks. But again, The Cheetahs failed to obtain a release. Nevertheless, in 1933-34, there were high hopes for the anti-war film Two Minute Silence, the first film the McDonough sisters conceived from the outset as a full talkie. But on its release in 1934, Two Minute Silence had mixed reviews and proved a financial failure. In the view of Paulette in later years, the film was too true for a lot of people. The financial losses incurred by the cheaters and Two Minute Silence, coupled with the financial impact of the Great Depression, left the McDonoughs with no money to continue production. After Two Minute Silence, Isabel married and retired from the screen, and Phyllis worked as a journalist. Having tried but failed to raise money for another film, Paulette withdrew from the field. She was the last Australian woman to direct a feature film until the 1970s. Even before the McDonough's first film, trends in film exhibition were gradually changing. In 1921, Union Theatres launched the large-scale modernisation of its older cinemas. That same year, Union Theatres and its rival Hoyts Theatres first announced plans for $3 million theatres, or what would become known as picture palaces, in Sydney, Perth and Melbourne. Construction of these picture palaces, intended to rival the most elaborate of American cinemas, didn't actually begin until the late 1920s. But in 1924, three cinemas built on picture palace lines were opened in Australian capitals. They were the Winter Garden in Brisbane, the Prince Edward in Sydney, and the Capitol in Melbourne. Cinema historian Ross Thorne later called the Melbourne Capitol, designed by architects Marion Mahani Griffin and Walter Burley Griffin, among the finest cinemas in the world. On its opening day in November 1924, the Melbourne Herald wrote, Architectural forms never before attempted here have been planned with a colour scheme of bronze and gold, and the musical and lighting equipment have been installed to produce the perfect palace of moving pictures. In America, and subsequently Australia, picture palaces were built to maximise revenue from the films they screened. Union Theatre's boss, Stuart Doyle, and Hoyts' managing director, Frank Thring Sr., strove to outclass each other with increasingly lavish venues. Hoyts built Regent Theatre picture palaces in nearly all state capitals and several major country centres. Union Theatre's opened the Capitol Theatre Sydney, the State Theatres of Sydney and Melbourne, the Ambassadors in Perth, and a rebuilt Brisbane Tivoli. A promotional brochure for Sydney State Theatre around the time of its opening in 1929 included Contemplate the peerless luxury and comfort, the beautiful Louis interior in gold and ivory, the vast vista of countless velvet seats seating 3,000 people, the immense sweep of the Golden Dome, the unparalleled magnificence and splendour of the giant proscenium arches, and you will get a very good idea of the tremendous strides made in theatre construction. October 1929 brought worldwide economic depression, and by mid-1931, Australia's nationwide film returns were at their lowest in five years. Picture palaces were now seen as white elephants, and the cost of installing sound equipment and plunging box office receipts forced Hoyts and Union Theatres to the edge of financial disaster. In March 1931, Doyle announced that a newly developed Australian sound on film recording system, invented by Tasmanian-born Arthur Smith, would be used for the making of Union Theatres and Australasian Films' first sound feature. This was to be the comedy melodrama On Our Selection, adapted from the highly popular stage play by Bert Bailey and Edmund Duggan and from Steel Rudd short stories. The film's director was Ken G. Hall, who had co-directed a silent feature and had worked in Australia's film distribution and exhibition businesses for two decades. Like Paulette McDonough, Hall had learned much by viewing mostly American films. Working as a film publicist, he also learned the vital importance of subject choice. He initially disapproved of Stuart Doyle's insistence that he make films with plot lines and characters as old-fashioned as those in On Our Selection, the Squatter's Daughter, 
and The Silence of Dean Maitland. Nevertheless, all of those films did well at the box office, especially Selection, which, by 1937, had established a national record for any film released in Australia to that time. In June 1932, Doyle formed Cinesound Productions, which allowed Hall to work continuously as a producer and director of feature films and supervisor of documentaries and newsreels. By 1940, Hall had produced 17 features for Cinesound, directing all but one of them. This made him Australia's most prolific producer-director of that decade. As a filmmaker, Hall showed his versatility with an output of rural and urban comedies, musicals, adventure melodramas and a children's film. From 1936 onward, Hall made films increasingly influenced by American cinema. These features were shot by a new director of photography, George Heath, who specialised in giving films what Hall called the rounded, beautifully warm images of Hollywood cinematographers. Starting with the 1937 comedy It Isn't Done, all of Cinesound's art direction on its final ten features was by Eric Thompson. He was an Australian architect who had worked for ten years as an art director at America's MGM Studios, often integrating Art Deco elements among the studio's visual signatures. In 1938, Hall's film Dad and Dave Come to Town brought his most complete embrace of modernism on screen. Today it's the best of all Ken Hall's films, thanks to a well-structured script, confident direction and its enduring comedy. Ken Hall, aided by his writers Frank Harvey and Burt Bailey, created Dad and Dave Come to Town as a fish-out-of-water comedy that initially shows two of its central characters, Dad and Dave Rudd, confused and befuddled by the technology, complexity and raucousness of Australia's modern cities. Where the evil city and the breaking of the drought and other early films had driven their farming people back to regenerate in the bush, the Rudd family in Hall's 1938 film ultimately adapt to the city and embrace its opportunities. Those opportunities come from Dad's inheritance of Cecile's, a city fashion and dress emporium, and how the Rudd family defeat the tactics of a corrupt rival competitor. A key figure in reversing the declining fortunes of Cecile's is the Rudd family daughter, Jill, who succeeds as a city businesswoman. The film's climax is an elaborate fashion parade to relaunch Cecile's and emphasise how much its modern clothing designs have superseded the old. During 1936, box office receipts for film exhibitors worldwide returned to their highest levels in five years. As Australian exhibitors shared in these fortunes, there was a new boom in theatre building and reconstruction. In mid-1935, Hoyts began streamlining their Melbourne suburban theatres, and in early 1936, the now Greater Union theatres began also to modernise. By this time, Sydney's suburban cinemas outnumbered city ones more than five to one. Where some of the biggest city cinemas could seat 2,000 people, the Australian suburban theatre trend of the late 1930s was that of the so-called intimate theatre, seating no more than 1,000. By 1939, architectural partners Guy Crick and Bruce Furse built, remodelled or modernised more than 100 independent Australian suburban and country cinemas. Central to the look of their work was the modern or streamlined style, with modern itself popularising Art Deco ingredients of bright colours and geometric shapes. Reporting on the newly opened King's Theatre Chatswood in September 1936, the magazine Decoration and Glass observed, Externally the building is treated in the continental style, which has become so popular in the eastern states of Australia in recent years. The motif is one of extreme simplicity, streamlined horizontal lines developing into curves, being the sole means of ornamentation. Everyone's magazine observed in December 1936 in relation to Crick and Furse's work on the King's Theatres. At each house, there is an atmosphere of intimacy and congenial comfort, which must please, while the attractive features of the exterior, invariably futuristic, are highlighted by the architect's guidance on an expertly balanced use of tube lighting in suitable colours. Theatres in the mid to late 1930s, which in CBD Sydney alone 
were converted from their original design to an Art Deco look included the Lyceum, the Lyric and the Crystal Palace, the latter of which was renamed the Century. As a long-term film showman, Cinesound's Ken Hall was ever alert to what the public wanted. From 1938 to 1940, knowing that his public was increasingly aware of the possibilities of another world war, he produced only comedies at Cinesound. In 1938, Dad and Dave Come to Town was the second of the six comedies he would make in a row. In 1940, the last of them was Dad Rod MP. An allegory of the European war, it showed democratic interests opposing powerful enemies. The film ended with Dad's maiden parliamentary speech insisting, Our country must be saved if it is to remain a habitation of free men. After Dad Rod MP, Cinesound's feature production was suspended for the duration of the war, which had erupted in September 1939. Throughout the conflict, Ken Hall and his studio focused entirely on newsreels and documentaries. But after the war, Cinesound feature filmmaking was never resumed. In the immediate post-war decades, Australia's visible modernisation, especially through the design of housing and public buildings, would accelerate. The design and wide availability of cinemas, including the newly introduced drive-in theatres, would keep pace with many other aspects of post-war modernism. The start of television broadcasting in 1956 would eventually cut a swathe through the number of Australia's cinemas. But television itself was, of course, a new entertainment revolution. It's a new type of modernity whose continued evolution has brought us to the streaming of entertainment, which is part of our world today. Any questions about the, the filmmakers involved, either the McDonough sisters or Ken Hall? I, I don't know how many people today are aware of the McDonough sisters. They've had a bit of publicity due to the um, restoration of the silent version of the Cheetahs in the last few years. But um, prior to that, I think they've been very much um, um, an unknown force. They were, they were very well known in their day, which was, you know, late 20s, early 30s. But after that, their, their public profile diminished somewhat. Yeah, I found it interesting that they produced that um, Two Minute Silence. I think I was reading about that. I think you wrote an article about them for the National Film and Sound Archive, Graham. Mm. And, and the Two Minute Silence, um, very interesting. Um, and um, it's just too bad that it didn't quite get the reception that it... I haven't ever watched it, but just reading about that, the, the fact that somebody had produced a, I guess you could say uh, an anti-war uh, movie um, was, is, but uh, yeah, didn't get quite the reception. Um, yeah, but, uh, look, okay. it, it, tragically, it's a lost film. I mean, there are stills, which is great, but you know, it is a lost film. Um, the McDonough's have been encouraged to produce it because um, the stage play written by Leslie Halen, a uh, journalist at that time and um, later a parliamentarian, um, had done tremendously well at the Community Playhouse in Sydney. And um, Community Playhouse, which was run by a woman called Carrie Tanner for several years, um, uh, did much better out of Two Minute Silence than any other play they, 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 they produced. It ran month after month. Um, and so the McDonald's thought, well, not only do we subscribe to the point of view of the play, which is anti-war, um, but we... Uh, we would very much like to make a film of it because we think people will want to see it. But part of the problem there, I think, was lack of money. The film only had a $1,500 budget. Um, and from what I can gather was essentially film theatre. I mean, the, it, it had very mixed reviews. Um, those who liked it said the performances were all terrific and the fact that it was film theatre was, was in its favour. Um, but unfortunately, with the film now being lost, it's, it's impossible to tell. At the moment, I hope it's found. Can you talk about modernism in the local set design? Look, there was a there was a touch of modernism in a film that Ken Hall directed in 1934, starring um, Roy Reen or Mo, the comedian, um, where there was a, a gigantic ballroom set, which was very much um, Art Deco in influence. Um, but it really kicked in in a big way with the appointment of um, Eric Thompson, who had worked at MGM 
Um, unfortunately, because, uh, he, I mean, Eric Thompson may have kept a diary or notes or something like that, but it's not possible to find out all, all, you know, the credits in which he worked at MGM, um, because the credits at MGM generally went to the, the head of the art department, Cedric Gibbons. Um, but uh, yeah, look, modernism was very much a, a feature of Ken Hall reaching out um, to a broader audience. Um, one reality in the mid to late 30s, unlike the early 30s, um, was that um, the expenses of production for, for, for Australian films were, were increasing and Australian filmmakers realised they needed an international audience. And so the, the embrace of modernism was, was part of, of that reaching out and it included the films that Ken Hall was making, even the Dad and Dave films, which were, you know, rural comedies. Um, there's, it's, it's an area that um, is, is ripe for further exploration. <laughs> I don't have terribly much more to say about, about modernism in, in the films that were made at that time, um, but certainly of um, all the filmmakers who were operating locally at that time, Ken Hall um, had more of an opportunity to, to feature modernism on, on screen from time to time, not, not in every film and not in it, by no, no means in every scene either. Robin would like to know if Dremoyne House still exists. No, unfortunately, Jemoyne House was demolished in about 1971. Its fortunes had declined somewhat from um, the 1920s. It, it became, it was divided into flats. <laughs> I wouldn't call them apartments. It was divided into flats and it was really allowed just to, to run down. Um, there was a, there's an article by, there's an art, article which features an interview with Phyllis McDonough, who, as, as I said, was herself a journalist in later years. And she visited the place in the 1960s and she was appalled at, at, at how, how much it had been run down. Um, but yeah, look, it was on a very substantial property originally. It's, it's, if you do Google searches under Drumoyne House, Drumoyne, you'll, you'll find a number of references. And there are some beautiful stills taken in the mid 19th century of Drumoyne House in its heyday. Um, the stills are, are for some reason held by uh, Sydney University archives, but a number of them are available online. What happened to all the cinemas that you've mentioned in your talk? Have they been lost? The In, in terms of looking at CBD Sydney, uh, a lot of Sydney's were lost when the Hoyts Entertainment Centre was opened in 1975, and that meant the banding together of a number of screens or, you know, the availability of a number of screens, which previously had been in, in, in separate um, places. Um, the, it, the, the arrival of the 70s saw the arrival of the multiplex and the, the arrival of the multiplex was long lasting and is, is not about to go away. Um, in the 1970s, the Prince, beautiful Prince Edward Theatre, which, which literally was named, its tagline, its publicity tagline was the Theatre Beautiful, was demolished. Um, uh, many of the King's cinemas um, were demolished, certainly the one in, in Chatswood is long gone. Um, a number of them have been repurposed. There's one in Bronte, I believe, which is which uh, still exists, um, but it's a it's a, a combination of a gym and something else, I think, at the moment. Um, the majority of the King's cinemas, which were built in the mid late to late 1930s, have unfortunately gone. You know, it's a great pity. Kath Bishop would like to know: Are there any papers for the Madonna sisters? Are there papers? Yes, there are. There, there are scrapbooks, um, and uh, some production documents. It's mostly publicity uh, held by the National Film and Sound Archive in Canberra. Um, one of their scrapbooks, and I think their autograph book, have been um, digitised and they're available up on online as part of the National Film and Sound Archive website. So you can you can go and search on the website and just type in Madonna Sisters and you'll find this wealth of material, which they've which they've um, done in terms of profiling within the last five to six years. Carol has an interesting question about the talkies. Did they make the Australian accent more apparent? Not really. It was usually the um, the reverse. That there was a lot of concern with the arrival of talkies. Um, that um, the American accent would take over, that Americanisms would come in um, 
you know, they're particularly worried about gangster slang, things like that. Uh, and there'd been a lot of concern as well in the late 1920s about the impact of American films on Australian society. And it was one of, one of the things looked into um, at a Royal Commission into the moving picture industry, which had been um, kicked off for a variety of reasons in, in 1927. Um, but no, I don't think um, talkies had much of an impact on, on the Australian accent. Um, it continued to be perpetuated both in, in film and on radio and, of course, later on television. Oh, apparently Mark says that he that in the Cheetahs, one of the locations is the Asta, which is like two or three doors down from History House on the yes. Street. Yes. On the roof of the Asta, there's, there's this wonderful kind of roof garden. Um, well, it's it's really a kind of you know imitation ancient Greek um, series of pillars and and and, and a, a garden setting. But yeah, there's there's one of the sequences in the Cheetahs, and in fact. It, um, Visible modernity in the Cheetahs includes the construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And so there's coverage of that in, in the silent version, where you see the two arches, you know, joined by an optical effect, which the cameraman Jack Fletcher used. Um, and also in the sound on film version, that, that same optical effect is used. Um, but yeah, look, it's I've I've spent a bit of time looking into the various locations and, that the McDonald's used and whether they survive. Um, there was a place called Rothsay, which apparently still survives in the eastern suburbs, which was used in their first film, Those Who Love. Um, uh, what else still survives? Um, oh, um, a hotel down in the Southern Highlands, um, which also appears in the Cheetahs, that, that actually survives. And so, you know, it's, a, it's been adapted to a modern hotel in, in, in within an old structure anyway. And Richard White has a question about the two minute silence. Was the criticism focused on the anti-war subject or the production uh, rate? No, it was on the quality of the film and what some critics saw as the variability of the performances. Um, Smith, Smith's Weekly, um, one of whose principal journalists was um, the poet Kenneth Slesser, was very pro the McDonald's, so that virtually anything they did was, was praised. And so Smith's Weekly gave it their, I think they gave it a triple A, which was their highest honour for, for any film they'd ever reviewed. Um, but the Sydney Morning Herald was, was less impressed with the film. Um, they, they found it a bit forced and theatrical and they found it, um, they found its, its performances quite variable as well. Um, Paulette McDonough had, had to, she said she worked, had to work incredibly hard with, with stage actors. She said un, untrained or amateur actors, in, including people that they recruited from among their friends, um, were, were much more malleable. But he, Paulette said that stage actors often came in with with stage techniques that they'd been honing in some cases for 20 or 30 years. And um, if they refused to change their ways, Paul, it would just film their over the top performance and then show them their rushes the next day and they would, they would be su suitably aghast and chastened. Um, they'd toned down their performance to a more naturalistic level under Paulette's direction after that. That was a bit more difficult with the coming of sound because with with a silent film, of course, with there being no sound recording, a director could literally talk an actor through a performance. Um, I think with, with, with sound, there was no way she could have done that with the two minute silence actors, although she did do the same thing of screening um, the rushes to Frank, Frank Layton was one particular actor. Frank Layton was later a very good skill, skilled screen actor in several films made by Cinesound. And, and later on, he had a career in Britain. But um, Paulette said she had to work particularly hard with him in two minute silence to sort of tone down the ham level. Incidentally, just before I, I finish, if I'm almost finished, I wanted to acknowledge the National Film and Sound Archive for most of, most of the film stills from Australian films that I use. They, they're a great resource for films and you know, the surviving Australian films as well as stills. So in many cases with Australian silent films having been lost in, in such large numbers, the stills and other documentation is what survives, which is great. Thank you very much, Graeme, for 
um, fascinating insight that matches so nicely with what Scott and Anna were telling us. Um, I notice that a few of the questions that a number of people are coming up to their centenary and suddenly the 1920s is on uh, historical groups um, radar. Robin, I think it is, was commenting about Lennox Head having its centenary and I'm sure there'll be a number of suburban uh, and country societies that will have 1920s anniversaries. And it seems to me that the presentations we've had today uh, are a real um, invitation to explore those 1920s. It, it seems to me, particularly for those suburban societies, the domestic architecture that Anna was talking about and the um, types of uh, furniture, furnishings and appliances that, that were in the houses, is something that so many uh, historical groups would be able to echo off and then add in the architectural details that um, Scott uh, has had about the, the public buildings. Particularly, I, I was so struck, Scott, with the insurance company buildings that you see in so many country towns in the 1920s and 30s, not just the banks, but in particular, those insurance companies just dominate um, streetscapes of so much of um, rural New South Wales that I, I've had the pleasure of seeing. And the, the cinemas, um, yes, they're often there as carpet warehouses or um, a whole range of sadly um, altered buildings. Um, uh, I can remember going to the Prince Edward um, I think perhaps I got my dislike of gladiolos from all of those flower displays on those big occasional tables. They seem to haunt my uh, childhood memories. And your photos, Graham, I thought put those back very powerfully. So um, we're, we're approaching 12.30 and the end of, of this session. Uh, and I do want to thank both of our speakers for really stimulating our ideas about the way in which what's often a, a sort of a leftover decade, but, but now for us coming out of COVID, we realise we can probably identify much more with the 1920s than we had anticipated, that not only in the world around us, but um, the idea of having a hatch for your um, online shopping being delivered into your house reminds me of those motel rooms with the little hatches where the breakfast got delivered, um, that there is much we can learn and take on board for uh, going forward into what will be our brave new world. So thank you to our three speakers. Thank you for those who've come. Some of you I'll see this afternoon. We've broken this into two sessions, just like we have a two day conference, we've got two sessions. So I'll see some of you, I hope this afternoon for the um, business session with affiliated societies, um, management assistance and some presentations and thank yous to people who've worked so hard. But I would now particularly like to thank Philip for the work he's done, not just on this presentation, but throughout COVID, Philip is our digital, media person and he, he has been helping us all get up to speed with modern technology, which is going to be our salvation. So I think that um, I particularly want to thank, thank Philip uh, for uh, his work this morning and in indeed of all of our Zoom presentations. Zoom will continue from the RAHS. What we've found is that many of our members don't live in Sydney and can't come to History House. And what we're finding is that Zoom offers us enormous possibilities of um, interacting with so many historians. So a particular thank you again to the three presenters. And um, I hope the sunshine is still out there, maybe no rain for Anna in Canberra, uh, and that you can enjoy uh, a little bit of um, hours of uh, uh, fresh air outside. So thank you, everybody. and. Goodbye.